So I'm a physician. I'm a Harvard-trained anesthesiologist. I currently work at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and I previously was on the faculty at UCLA. So I have some experiences at these three different institutions bicoastally, and because I've been a medical error and decision uh, researcher for about a decade now, I have a large, large collection of stories from physicians and patients around the globe, and I'd like to share one of those with you. An internist wrote to me, I remember vividly the day the medical examiner walked into my office to tell me. She was a longtime patient of mine. I knew her well. She came to me for her usual, just another migraine. And less than 24 hours later, she was dead. He goes on to say, this was a terrible event in my own life. With what seems like remarkable carelessness, I missed an impending intracranial hemorrhage. Then he says, then he says, <laughs> 25 years later, I can still describe her in fine detail. Down to the clothes, the dress she was wearing, and her hairdo. This is a patient of his who has died. And he describes it as a terrible day in his life. And we can understand that. He cared for this woman. And frankly, I'm not sure. He says remarkable carelessness. I doubt it. This is 25 years ago. I don't think somebody with chronic migraines who comes in with the same constellation of symptoms that is consistent with their usual migraine would normally have a full impending brain bleed workup. So frankly, I doubt that this could have been prevented, but it has haunted this physician for a long time. The first victim is the patient, right? We always uh, think about this, that anyone who is harmed or killed, hurt, uh, in medicine or just in life. That's the victim. That's the first victim. And it's not always a mistake that's been made. Sometimes it's just bad luck. Patients have diseases. We can't always fix them. That's the first victim. The second victim used to be thought of as family and friends and, and still indeed includes family and friends. But Dr. Albert Wu coined the term second victim to apply to the caregivers the nurses and the physicians who did their best. And still, bad things happen. You might recognize this image from Reddit. This was recent. This is an emergency room physician whom I don't know uh, who had to take a, a moment because he apparently he tried to save the life of a teenager and failed to do so. And this made the rounds on social media, which just goes to show social media is so much more powerful, apparently, than major medical journals. So I hope you'll tweet and tell everybody. So the second victim, regardless of fault. Now, when I was at UCLA, my colleagues and I did a study to ask anesthesiologists what their experiences were with really bad events. And Gazzoni and his colleagues have done some studies as well that have been published in, I believe, 2012 and 2008. So there's some literature out here. And we asked, you know, we asked questions, of course, and then we had free text response, you know, tell us your thoughts. And somebody said, and this is not the only sentiment, bad things happen in medicine all the time, and we should be able to deal with it. In fact, I believe you prefaced this by saying, this whole idea bothers me. Bad things happen in medicine. We should be able to deal with it. Well, he has a point. Bad things do happen in medicine all the time. And are we as doctors, nurses, and other clinicians supposed to just fall apart every time anything bad happens? Of course not. So let's give some consideration to what makes adverse events worse psychologically to the caregiver. Do you guys say everything the same thing that everybody says, which is basically, if there's permanent harm or death, that makes it worse. If you make a mistake, but the patient gets better, a little bit better. Or if you don't make a mistake, but something devastating happens and they walk away, you know, they get better, that feels better. If a mistake has been made, that feels worse. If it's your mistake, that feels much, much worse. If it's unexpected, a healthy, routine case, that feels terrible. If somebody's been demolished by a Mack truck, it's a little bit expected. You did your best, but it's a little expected. 
But when it's very gruesome, though, a, a trauma like that, that can really hit hard as well. And especially if it's a violent crime, an act of terror, or a perceived vulnerable population, like a small child or a pregnant person, right? So all of these things come together to make us feel much, much, much worse about adverse events. And so although we can take care of patients and bad things can happen in medicine, from time to time, something's gonna hit us hard. And when it does, what happens to the second victim, the clinician? Well, one thing we know is 70% of respondents to our study had symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. So they couldn't sleep, they couldn't concentrate, their judgment was clouded. They lived in fear, fear of litigation, which is a huge stressor, even if they haven't done anything wrong. Fear of loss of their professional reputations, even if they haven't done anything wrong, and fear of themselves, self-doubt. Could I have prevented this? Is there something we could have done differently? So they get PTSD. The other thing that happens is they say, I don't think I can do this anymore. And they consider a career change. 12% of our folks considered a career change. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, someone who cares enough about my outcome to think about walking away because it didn't go well, I want that person in medicine. I don't want them to walk away. And we know that physicians kill themselves. They take their own lives at rates that are estimated to be two up to even six times that of the average population, even more so in high-risk specialties like the emergency department, anesthesiology, surgeon, suicide. And I would be remiss if I didn't say it's not just doctors. This is just a single clip you can Google for yourself, but look at the little clip. A nurse with 24 years of an unblemished record apparently made a medication error. The baby died and she killed herself. That's a loss to medicine. To me, this is a public health crisis because we're losing our people. We're losing them to PTSD. We are losing them to career change and we're losing them to suicide. That's astounding. But in medicine, these are the kind of comments that I got in my survey. We are supposed to soldier on. This is what we do and we should deal with it. And there's always another case to do. And this is a good point. There is always another case to do. Patients do need us to continue to take care of them, some more urgently than others. Not everybody uh, needs to be taken care of that day right away. And it makes me wonder, would they want to be taken care of by us in the immediate aftermath of something like that? Remember this? It's hard to forget these images, and this may seem totally unrelated. The miracle on the Hudson, right? Captain Sully's landing. And he and I had the opportunity to talk on the phone a couple of years back, and one of the things that came from our conversation that really struck me is the difference between healthcare and aviation. I know yesterday someone said, let's stop with the aviation analogy. But I don't think we can, because you know what happened? Nobody plucked those guys out of the river and said, you know what, there's planes to fly. Can you get back there and get going? But in medicine, that's how it is. Our patients die or they suffer, they go to the ICU and someone says, you know, we're behind schedule, there's another patient to get to. And I think that's a problem. So as I mentioned before, I'm a patient safety scientist, really. So why am I up here talking about physician well-being? Well, I'll tell you, because of this. I think they're directly related. I think physician well-being is directly related to patient well-being. And if my plane goes down, I may be less safe to the next patient. You wouldn't let those folks fly you around that same day, probably not even that week. And because common sense tells us they wouldn't be in the right frame of mind. Here's an article that I published in JAMA about the conversation that I had with Captain Sully. Nobody would have considered pulling them out of the river. That's so critical. The patients aren't planes. But I think we do go down. We do go down with the ship or the plane, so to speak. And that leads me to wonder, is there a third victim, and is it you? This is not my study, this is Fizzoni's study, but they asked people who said that they had symptoms like second victim phenomenon after a catastrophic event, and they said, what's your perceived ability to provide safe medical care? 
almost 70% said it was compromised for the rest of the day. About half said at least 24 hours. And look at this large chunk of people, 20% a week, 15% longer than a week. These are people who believe their ability to provide safe care is compromised. How many of these people do you think got any time off? 7% of these people were given some time off. That's staggering to me and it's a little scary. So I want to know what the public thinks because I wanted to know, are we going back to work because this is some sort of self-inflicted physician thing where we just have to you know, be strong or is it inflicted by our departments or who, who's doing this to us? Why are we doing this? So I took a public opinion survey. I went to Google and I asked 4,000 average Americans, randomized completely by Google, I asked 4,000 people, a patient dies in the operating room despite doctors doing everything right, and the whole team, to save him. Now you are the next patient. And I asked them to sort of agree or not agree with some statements. 25% said that death is not relevant to my surgery. But 75% apparently thought it was relevant, and I don't know to what degree, of course. This isn't a huge you know, study, this is a simple question. I don't know if they think it's relevant because it means they'll be delayed, if they think it's relevant because they think it means the doctor will be impacted or some other reason, I don't know. But 25% said it's totally not even relevant. And a, a smaller number, but about 20% say they wanna go ahead and have their surgery as planned. But what that also says to me is 75% think it's relevant in some way, and 80% of people do not wanna have their surgery as planned. So, I was surprised when I saw that only one third of those people agreed that the physicians should be offered relief from duty. If 80% of them wanna go home and reschedule, can the doctor not go home too? What about the nurse? Only a third agreed that those clinicians should be offered psychological support. And this is really a question for you here at MedEx because we're talking about patient engagement, patient choice, and patient empowerment. 12% said it's appropriate to tell the next patient so that they could have the opportunity to reschedule if they chose. Now, I don't mean tell them in the way of a HIPAA violation, oh, Joe Smith just died, but to go in and say, hey, I'm sorry about the delay. We were having a resuscitation, you know? Maybe not in so, so colorful of language, but to basically say, we were trying frantically to save a life, it didn't work out. So we're trying to get ourselves together here, and you're next, and we're ready for you. <laughs> Is there anyone in this room who would say, yeah, sign me up, I'm ready to go? I'm here already, I'm in my hospital gown, my IV's in, haven't had anything to eat all night or day. Most people, I think, would get up and leave. And I think we should consider whether they have an ethical right to know that. Because patients ask me all the time, how old are you? No, I dye my hair, I'm a little older. They ask, how old are you? How long have you been doing this? Where did you train? Have you done this before? Did you get a good night's sleep? Have you had your coffee? So if they wanna know all of this, maybe they, want to know that too. I don't know. Certainly patients are harmed by far more mundane things all the time, right? And physicians are too. So this is maybe not the biggest problem in medicine, but I think it's an underappreciated problem. So when we have people saying that this is the devastating day in their lives and something bad happens to their patient, whether or not they did anything wrong, I like to be encouraged by the other comments that I got from my study. We are human beings. As a profession, we need to understand that. We must do much more to support our colleagues. These aren't my words, right? These are people answering our survey. Subsequent patients may be put at risk. I'm not the only one with this idea. And finally, no death is easy, even when it's expected. That's the kind of doctor I want taking care of me. So when I think about the ancient proverb, physician, heal thyself. I don't think we should interpret that to mean heal yourself by brushing it off, sucking it up, and soldiering on. Let's get back to work. I think we mean heal ourselves by, as a medical community and a community of patients to give this the attention that it deserves. I think our well-being and perhaps our very lives do depend on this matter. Mm -hmm.